Sound and logical. Is a mental illness? Is the Bible holy? Or just full of holes? Old Testament New Testament The Bible is divided into two parts that we refer to as testaments. Test Test Noun 1. The means by which the presence, quality, or genuineness of anything is determined. A means of trial. 2. The trial of the quality of something, to put to the test. 3. A particular process or method for trying or assessing. 4. A set of questions, problems, or the like, used as a means of evaluating the abilities, aptitudes, skills, or performance of an individual or a group. Examination 5. Psychology A set of standardized questions, problems, or tasks designed to elicit responses for use in measuring the traits, capacities, or achievements of an individual. Amant Amant, noun a person with severely deficient intellectual capacity. From Latin omens, amet, insane, a, ab, out of. See ab one plus mens, mind. See mens one, in Indo-European roots. Amet, ab, out of. Plus, mens, mind. Out of one's mind. Amant, noun, synonym, see fool, number 4. Merriam-Webster thesaurus page, 24, fool, noun. 1. A person lacking in judgment or prudence, stop acting like a fool. Synonyms. Ass, asshead, damn fool, donkey, doodle, idiot, imbecile, jackass, jerk, madman, mooncalf, nincom, nincompoop, ninny, ninny hammer, poop, schmo, Schmuck, Tom Fool related. Blockhead, dimwit, dope, dumbbell, dummy, nitwit, numbskull, pinhead. Birdbrain, featherbrain, featherhead, rattlerbrain, scatterbrain. Goose, silly. Number 4. One who is mentally deficient, a badly retarded child, little more than a fool. Synonyms Amit, Cretan, Phoebe, Halfwit, Idiot, Imbecile, Moron. Natural, simpleton, soft head, underwood, zany. Merriam Webster Thesaurus page, 242. Now that you know what a test is, and you know what an almond is, a test almond is therefore an examination and or a test to see how much of a damn fool you are. Greetings, brothers and sisters. Welcome to another hour of power. This is TV Prank. My name is the Reverend Ed Cash. Cash money, y'all. And I'm Reverend Dr. Carl Pavos. And we're going to double team your faith today. Praise yeah. the Lord. That's right. We're going to reach down into your soul and get you in the mood. We're going to get you excited. We're going to make you feel good. I'm telling you, if all I had was a clock in my pants, it would be high noon right now. <laughs> well, I think you need to keep that time to yourself, Reverend. Pardon me, man. No, today's lesson is about tithing. That's right. Now, I know we've talked about giving of 10% of your earnings. We talked about that last week and the week before. And we're going to keep talking about it till y'all get it right. We never get tired of that subject because the Lord says you must store up treasures in heaven and not on earth. Oh, that's right. That's why there's a hole in the ozone layer now. Because y'all being tardy with your payments. That's right. Now, some of you, some of you been trying to skate by on 5 and 6%. Nice try, but you cannot fool the Lord. Now, I'm going to read off some names right now, and I want you to stand up when you hear your name. Raymond Gary. Up on your feet. 
Dorothy Bell. Roz and Shaw. Joe Wilson. No, Joe. Now your checks have bounced. Get out. Um, I'm realizing and recognizing that I'm going into a history in reference to the religious factor, but at the same time, language is very important to express first because language is really should be the introduction to anybody's lecture. What was the first language? I hear people say Hebrew was the first language. I heard some people say Arabic was the first language. And I'll be the first to tell you it was Meduneta. All right? Meduneta meaning Mother Nature. All right? That was the first language. Because once you see nature and you see it, you express the words that you see in nature. The very things that we see in nature. And because of that, we begin to start developing high culture, not civilization. Not civilization, because when you look up the word civilization, that's a process, bringing people from a criminal state of mind into something civil. So we was never civilized as a people. We was highly cultured. That's why it's important to express the language, because once you begin to start to express the language, then you can kill a lot of the debates only thing that the Greeks did was Hellenize everything that was Egyptian. So technically the Egyptian or the Greek language, I should say, is nothing but a corruption of ancient Egyptian language. That's all it is. They just Hellenized or changed or modified what was Egyptian and made it appear though it was Greek. Because the Greek was so infatuated with our powerful images, precepts, and concepts of our spirituality. So, and, and that's something different from religion now, because religion is totally different in reference to the spirituality of what our ancestors have. So that needs to be clear. But once that spirituality, the principalities of that spirituality was passed down, and when the Romans seen that, they're the ones who actually changed that, all right? They're the ones who came with that concept of the monotheism, all right? Which means they wanted to be the one who dominate and have the only one true God. That's what that whole concept of monotheism came in. Not to say that we didn't have that concept, but our concept was with the oneness of God. All right, we have the multi facets, but at the same time, we've seen the unison of one. All right, the Romans didn't see that. All right, they wanted control. They wanted you not to see the multi facets of, 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 of the Creator. He just wanted you to see that one icon and image. <laughs> Oh, you, you get out and take your fat wife with you. Go on, get on out of here. That's a sin. That's an unforgivable sin. I can feel the sin in this room tonight. Uh, it is that temptation that would make a woman sell her body for upwards of forty dollars, even though she wanted it as much as I did. Oh. <laughs> Reverend Pathos is trying to say is that we've all sinned. Not like me. Well, we ain't all freakazoids like you, but we've all sinned. You see, that's why you're here today. But that's okay, see, because the Lord forgives. He's forgiven me and will forgive you too. He does. That's what he does. I know because I've talked to the Lord. I've talked to him in tongues. He can that's right. That's the only way to get to the Lord. He don't answer if you just say, hey, Lord, you got to speak in a tongue. And this hold, man on, can hold, do on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I got a call right now. Oh, my gosh. It a little bit. No, no, little roll this video. No, 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 I got the spirit. I feel like healing. Yes, and I have a candidate like right here, Reverend, sitting Bring right in front of us. Come on up here, son. What is your affliction, brother? I, I, I can't move my leg. You can't move your leg. Well, let me get the spirit. Let me put my hand on it. I think I feel it. Oh, here it is. This is what's been holding you down. This wall has been holding you down, brother. You are healed. Get on out of here. Oh. Praise the Lord. The spirit has been lifted. <laughs> Yes. Now you've seen the Lord in effect. 
You have seen it. You've witnessed the Lord's spirit. You were there. Now it's time to pay the Lord. Pay him off. Pay that man his money. Now while I collect the offerings, Brother Pathos here will lead us in a song. Brother Pathos. Because like I said, again, words or the language is very important to express. All right? And that's important to know these things. So if we want to study the history, language will always have to be at the forefront. What, I don't give a crap what topic it is. It could be medicine. It could be science. It could be history. Whatever topic it is, language would always have to be the key. Unlocking the true mysteries behind what it is that we really need to know and what, where the, the true origin, not the origin, the true origin. Most people have never seen an image of the deity Yah called Yao and Yah, his name is spelled different ways in ancient Khmer. This is the moon divinity, the masculine moon divinity. And that's his title. So when people start talking about Yahweh and all that nonsense, this is where they stole the name of the deity from. This is where they took it from originally and then tried to add some foolish cosmology associated with Yahweh choosing the fictional character, you know, cartoon character. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> group of people, the Hebrews and so forth, and saying there is chosen people. In the Medutu, these are a number of different spellings of the name Yah, also Yahu, and so forth. So when you see the A, which is the reed right here, the flowering reed, the arm, forearm with the open palm facing upward, and then the twisted flax. So that's A, but also A, but it can also be E. Then you have the forearm, which is the aw ah sound. And then the twisted flax is the H sound, H sound, which is ya. And if it's pronounced ah, then it's ah. But if, if it's pronounced eh, in certain dialects, it's eh and ah. When we put eh and ah together, ea, 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 this is where you get ya from. When you say ya, the Y, the Y sound is not just one sound. It's a combination of E and A. E -a, e -a. And this is where you get the Ya sound from. So the determinative symbol is one of the phases of the moon. So this is another spelling of it with the phase of the moon, the determinative symbol perpendicular, another image of that and so forth. A number of different spellings of the name E -a. Then you have also, just so you can see that when you see the reed and the uh, forearm and the twisted flax and the addition of the chick, the little bird, that is the U or W. U and W are interchangeable. So in earlier texts, they would use the U and later texts, they use the W. That's interchangeable in English. It's interchangeable in European languages. It's interchangeable in ancient Afro-Akani, afro languages. So you look at the V about 1500 years ago, evolved into the U as a character. And then the U about 500 years later, evolved into the W, which is two U's side by side, W, or two V's side by side. V and V together is a double U. So V, U and W, it's the same root, the same character. So this is why V and W are interchangeable. In European languages, you have Sweden, SW, Sweden, SV, William, in certain European dialects, William or Wilhelm and others. But you also have in uh, Namibia and Angola, you have the Ovambo people, Ovambo, O-V-A, Ambo, Ovambo. But some of them pronounce it Ovambo with the W. You have the Eve people in Togo and Benin and so forth in Ghana. Some of them pronounce it Eve with a V. It's also spelled E-W-E, Ewe, and so forth. So the V and W sound interchange. So this is Ya plus the W or the U is Yao, Yao, and that's where that comes from. So that's why you have both spellings. You have the E-A-A. -E. 
H, ya, but you have the I, A, H, N, W, or U, yao, yao, and you have that. It talks about Yahweh was originally described as one of the sons of El in Deuteronomy, but this was removed by a later emendation to the text. So they talk about Yahweh being the one God and so forth, but in Deuteronomy, he's one of the sons, one of the many sons of the deity El. Later on, when Europeans continued to corrupt the text, they started saying that Yahweh and El is the same entity. In reality, El, which is the great divinity, El Gabal, the old man of the mountain and so forth is Ra. And then Yao, or Yahweh or Yao, Yahweh is a corruption of Yao, which is Tuhuti, the moon divinity, and El, which is Ur, is the great sun divinity that is Ra and Tuhuti. In Deuteronomy, um, El is the chief divinity, Yahweh is one of the sons of El. Then later on, they conflated the two. Now, so when they talk about his name is not attested among the other, um, other than among the Israelites and seems not to have any plausible etymology, that Eye, I said Eye, I am that I am, the explanation presented in Exodus, appearing to be a late theological gloss invented at a time when the original meaning had been forgotten and so forth. When you read in the biblical text, um, Yahweh is saying, well, my name is Yahweh. You're going to call me Yahweh from this point on. Prior to that, your fathers didn't know me as Yahweh. They knew me as El Shaddai and so forth. But from this point on, you're going to know me as Yahweh. When they're talking about Moses goes and sees the deity in the burning bush, he says, what is your name? And my name is Yahweh and all of that. And your forefathers didn't know me as Yahweh and all of that. So they're stating basically that prior to that little Moses era, 1200, 1250 BCE and so forth, around that particular time, um, nobody knew the divinity as quote unquote Yahweh. And this is the first time this divinity is being introduced because your forefathers didn't know me as Yahweh and all this other nonsense. So that's 1200, even if you want to say 1300 BCE, even if you want to see, say 1400 BCE, but that, that predates the whole fictional Moses character. But in that time period, in the little biblical text, they'll say, nobody knew my name is Yahweh. Your forefathers didn't know that. You're going to start calling me that from this point on. The moon god Yah in ancient Egyptian religion. And we can send you the link for this particular study. And we're not going to go through the whole thing. We just, there's just a couple of things we want to point out. So they're talking about how the moon god Yah is kind of overshadowed by the solar divinity. But what's important about this is when they reference the first mentions in the pyramid text, the Meru text of the divinity Yah as a lunar divinity. The pyramid text going back to 2600 so called BCE. So when they're talking about in the biblical time and Moses and during the time when the treasury cities of Pithom and Ramses are, you know, exist 1200, between 1200 and 1300 BC and so forth during that time period. And Yahweh is first introduced as a divinity to them. This is what they're saying in the text. When archaeologists come later, they realize it's all fraudulent. That's not the first time you hear of a Yah or Yao divinity. If that's 1200, 1300 BCE, if you go a thousand years before that, in fact, 1300 years before that, the Meru text, the pyramid text, the first, the earliest religious compositions in the world, you find that the divinity Yah or Yao is already incorporated fully in ritual. 1300 years prior. So that's the end of the little Yahweh being introduced as a divinity. Now, 
the moon god as a divinity. Some of the features of Yah endure through time, while others change. In the pyramid text, the deceased king is related to Yah through kinship ties, and the references to the celestial body are connected with his monthly cycle. In the coffin text and the Book of the Dead, his rebirth cycle and the light which the deceased um, aspires to join prevail. So in the pyramid text, Yah is mentioned on three different occasions. Two of those describe him as a deity with close family ties. Close family ties to the dead king as his father, <clears throat> as his father, he, and this is the text itself, he, meaning Heru on the horizon, shall commend Pepi to his father. Pepi was the king, the pair of the pharaoh and so forth, but this particular pyramid text, this pyramid was his. So he, meaning horse on the horizon, shall commend Pepi, the pair of the pharaoh, to his father, Yah, the moon, the moon dead. Pepi's sibling is the morning star god. So his father is the moon, his sibling is the morning star god. And then you see the actual text, pyramid text 507, and then also 1104 A to B. And his brother, Yah, the moon divinity, is the brother of the pair uh, or the pharaoh Pepe. And the morning star god is the sibling of Pepe. And so they have the text, and it's pyramid text 481, also 1001 B. The sentence constructed as a pu clause emphasizes the equation, the straight identification between the two beings. The third passage wishes that the deceased would be able to emulate the moon god in his monthly rebirth. You shall be born at your months like Yah, like the moon divinity. Now, so, when we look at the pyramid text and when we visit ancient command, we go into the pyramids and you can, we've taken photos of the text themselves, like in the pyramid of Teti and so forth, the mayor of Teti, we go inside and so forth and you can, we've taken pictures and video of the text themselves. And then we have the primary source that when we come back and look at this literature and so forth to see if they actually copy the, you know, text down faithfully, we can show the um, side by side comparisons. So in the earliest text, 1300 years before the so-called fictional Moses character says Yahweh first introduced himself. 1300 years before that, Yah is already fully incorporated in ritual in the cosmology. And of course, this is his iconography. Because we, get, we can't be fooled. We have to have critical thinking because when they're looking at that dictionary and they say the origin and the history of words, this is what I say to people look at the word true origin because there's a difference between true origin and origin because latin can be an origin hebrew can be an origin but the question is is it the true origin of that word i think i saw him on the hill the other day i think i saw him when i watched the children play but when i opened up my voice to sing in praise he ran away ran away have to wait for judgment. Wait a minute, hold on. This ain't working. Oh. One dollar, what's this, one dollar? No, no, we tried to do it the Lord's way, now we're going to do it the good old 125th Street 7 Avenue way. Give up the money now, pay the Lord. You wanted heaven, now reach for it. Yeah, now give me the money. Because we have been so highly poisoned and enculturated with the poison to a point where we can't even hear. So it makes sense when you say, those who got a hear, a ear cannot hear, and those who got an eyes cannot see, and those who have a heart cannot perceive, because they had poison our hearts, poison our ears and our eyes and our minds. So it makes sense why George G.M. James says, mental bondage is invisible violence. When the president is being elected to be president and he's sworn in, what ceremony is that called, y'all? Inauguration. Inauguration. Do you know that when you go do the etymology on the word inauguration, that means augury? Did you know that? It means augury? And do you know what augury is? Witchcraft and sorcery and divination. And who they need for that? The priests. 
So the, the president's swearing in is based upon witchcraft. So in England, there's also a church, like the Church of England, all right? It's not, you know, it's, it's a religious government. You see what I'm saying? And this is how they assimilated to split the civil side of the theocracy, you know, where it looked like if though there is a separation between church and state, and it's not. But as far as our brothers in, um, into the school system, we as a people have to take the initiative to educate our brothers. Education is really going to be the key, sis. Education and economics. Give it up. Give it up. Right, I want you. I'm no, you're different, brothers. Sound and logical.